Having studied for the last couple of years the relationship between the Reformation and music, and by music tonight I mean congregational singing, having studied the relationship between the Reformation and music, I've come to feel a little bit like King Josiah must have felt during a certain point in his reign in Judah. King Josiah was reigning in Judah in a dismal time of Israel's history, history of God's people. But God had given Josiah a new heart, and Josiah was interested in reforming the life of the people and the Church of Christ in that day and age. So he made a determination and a decree to restore the temple. One of his servants, a scribe, going through the temple, cleansing it and refurbishing it, found a scroll, and on that scroll was written God's law. This scribe, whose very occupation it was, was to read and copy God's law, had never read it. After he read the law, in fear, he went to Josiah and read it to Josiah. And as soon as Josiah heard it, he rent his clothes and consulted with the prophet who told him that though God was going to judge Israel, God was going to be merciful to Josiah because of Josiah's change of heart. They didn't even know what the law was. In Israel, they did not know the law of God. Now, the matter isn't so serious now and here, but it might be, and if we're not careful, it may come to be so. That is, we may forget all about the important place of music in the Church of Jesus Christ. It's not that the Reformed churches don't sing any longer. It's not that Reformed churches don't have music as a part of their congregational worship. It's not that Reformed churches don't allow the common members to sing, or that they try to sing in Latin, some foreign tongue that no one understands. But we are at the risk of forgetting why the church sings, and we are at risk of forgetting the importance of singing in congregational worship. We are at risk of forgetting the important place that music had in the Reformation. See, a lot of young people and children here very encouraged by that. Let's take a little quiz, a Reformation quiz. I dare guess that most of the young people would be able to get the first question right. What was the most important doctrine that God restored in the church at the Reformation. Probably all of the young people would be able to say justification by faith alone. For an extra credit, we could ask, what was the formal principle of the Reformation? And probably the good students would remember the formal principle was the authority of the Word of God. No longer the church is the authority for faith and life. The Word of God is the sole standard. But how many of us would be able to delineate the place that music played in the Reformation? How many would be able to explain what the Reformers had to say and why they had to say it with regard to congregational singing in public worship? And now you know why I say I feel a little bit like King Josiah felt at that time in his reign in Israel, and why I'm eager to speak tonight on the indispensable place of music in the Reformation. And I put that little word, the, in parenthesis because I want to bring it into the present and, at least by implication, explain how music will have a place and can have a place in Reformation today. The indispensable place of music in the Reformation, though, first, and then I let you draw out the implication about its place in the churches today, in the church today. You see, the Reformation was about more than doctrine. The Reformation was certainly about doctrine, the doctrines that I mentioned, justification by faith alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, and that without works. The Reformation was about the doctrine of Scripture, It's not the Pope and it's not the decrees of the church that have authority for what we believe and how we live. It's the Word of God, the Scripture. 
And if you add to those the doctrine of the priesthood of every believer, all of you have access to God without someone helping you, and all of you are priests, that is, and all of you are prophets, then we understand something about the importance of doctrine at the Reformation. But the Reformation was also a reform of worship. It had to do with liturgy, the activity of the people of God as they come together on the Sabbath day. Now relate those two, doctrine and worship. How in the world can a man praise God in worship if he does not have the right doctrine? Why would a man praise God in worship if he were taught to believe that his acceptance by God depends on his works? Why, of course, he'd be terrified. He would not be able to sing, as we sang tonight, about the new song that fills our hearts. Calvin famously said that we have the right doctrine in order that the church may have proper worship. And that's the order. We have the right doctrine so that there may be true worship. Or to put it differently, right doctrine aims at worship. Worship is the goal. The way to reach that goal is the truth preached from the pulpit. That's the relationship between the two. We'll see that more in a moment. So important a place did the Reformation give to liturgy that the Reformers would say, if you would ask them today, the Reformation was nothing if it did not also include the reform of worship. Now there were other things the Reformation did for singing. I'm not interested in them primarily tonight. The Reformation restored the congregation to singing. It used to be prior to Martin Luther and John Calvin's day, it was only the choirs who sang for the people. The priests were able to sing. The people were not able to sing. The Reformation changed that. And that's why the history of Reformed churches, though many have forgotten that aspect of Reformation too, is congregational worship without choirs. That's the history of Reformed churches. Reformation also brought singing back to the vernacular, that is, the language of the common people. Whereas in the Roman Catholic Church, the priests sang in Latin, a language they didn't understand, and mumbled the Latin so much that even if you did understand it, you wouldn't be able to understand what they sang. At the Reformation, they changed that, and the people of God sang in their own language, the German or the French or whatever country they lived in. They understood 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 14's requirement, pray and sing with understanding. But my point tonight is that those two matters were important. All of the people singing, and all of the people singing in the right language, the one they understood, because singing was fundamental in the worship of the people of God. Singing is important, and it was in the Reformation. They all agreed on that. Luther and Calvin and Bucer and Zwingli and the rest. I'm going to talk mostly tonight about Luther and Calvin, but it's only because we don't have time to mention the place of Zwingli and Bucer too. I say they all agreed in the importance of music. They had disagreements with regard to music, some disagreements. You know, perhaps that Luther wanted instruments in congregational singing. Luther would have been pleased with the beautiful sound that the organ played tonight. Calvin would have differed with Luther and said, we will not have any accompaniment of the singing. And if you would know, the Reformed tradition, our tradition too, was singing without accompaniment. They also disagreed on the use of psalms exclusively or hymns. And whereas Luther was in favor of hymns, Calvin said, no, we will sing only the Psalms, the 150 Psalms of David. He came to that position, Calvin did, after he had written, because Calvin had the ability to write music too and versify music, after Calvin had written music that was hymns, Ten Commandments, and the Song of Simeon, and the Song of Mary, and the Apostles' Creed, Calvin versified those for singing. Later on, Calvin changed his mind and believed, no, we will sing only the Psalms. But that's not my point tonight either. 